so my name is Denny Dahl. I work for D-Wave. We make a quantum computer. Uh, this, this, this is going to sound like a planet report, uh, or a status report from some distant planet. You know, it doesn't really fit into the uh, uh, mainstream here so much. So I've been living uh, up here in Los Alamos for the last 16 months, and about 12 months ago we installed uh, D-Wave 2X. It's our third generation system. It's a quantum computer. And what I just want to talk about is not the hardware, not quantum mechanics, um, but I want to talk a little bit about the experience at the lab. I've been at the lab uh, trying to help users wrap their head around our programming model. Our programming model is very different from classical computer. So, you know, I think right away that kind of qualifies us as uh, disruptive technology. Um, the thing that's really dramatic is the activity uh, at Los Alamos that's, that's been focused on uh, the quantum computer. And by the way, I should apologize to Candy Colhane if she's here because I stole the last slide from her and maybe this one too. Um, so at the lab, uh, everything, the, the research is all tied to pro, uh, projects. Uh, the projects are tied to charge codes and so money is sort of doled out to allow people to uh, you know, undertake exploratory projects and other kinds of projects to let them, uh, you know, get their feet wet and, and learn about this technology. Um, as you can see, there's been a lot of projects kicked off over the last, uh, you know, I guess, year, uh, two dozen of them. And they, uh, they wouldn't really qualify as applications. They're not, you know, kind of at the level of, say, pharmaceutical or oil and gas or financial. But uh, the researchers at Los Alamos are sort of systematically learning to think about this new programming model and, uh, you know, sort of peeling away the layers of the onion and trying to figure out how to build tools and kind of raise their, raise their level of understanding so that they can actually start to think about, you know, applications. Um, but the thing that's really driving all this is the, is the promise of performance. And so that's what I'd like to talk about for the next couple of slides. Uh, the, the particular project I'm going to uh, talk about is this one here, number nine, inferring uh, sparse representations for object classification. So it kind of fits into this world of machine learning. And uh, this was work done by this team of five people at the lab. Um, this talk actually uh, was uh, presented over at uh, the Center for Nonlinear Studies a few weeks ago. And uh, it, was, it was really great. I'm just going to pick a couple of, cherry pick a couple of slides out of there that um, uh, do some performance comparisons. So uh, these comparisons are all between uh, the D-Wave system um, and then a classical solver commercially available one called Garobi. And the way to understand these slides is that we're looking for an energy here. Uh, lower numbers are better. And then the, the real question is, how long did it take you to get there? And what, what's the quality of the answer? So in this case here, you see that um, the D-Wave system and Garobi are getting uh, same quality answer. D-Wave typically runs in a few seconds. In this case, Garobi is 480 seconds. In this case here, quality of the answer is identical. D-Wave is a few seconds, Garobi is 2,300 seconds. It's a larger problem. Um, then going on, in this example here, uh, the D-Wave actually got a slightly better quality answer than Garobi. Again, our execution time is a few seconds, Garobi is somewhere over nine hours. And then in this last comparison, um, the quality of the answer that came out of the D-Wave system is quite a bit better uh, than the Groby answer. And Groby got cut off at nine hours here. And D-Wave execution time is a few seconds. So this is the promise. You know, this, this technique, this kind of quantum computer, is not amenable to all problems. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of art just associated with identifying a kind of problem that is amenable to this platform. Uh, the community as, as a whole, as small as it is, is, is you know, still in the early part of, of this learning curve. So whether, whether an application that you care about can be mapped onto this kind of uh, architecture, that's a hard problem in itself. There's more hard work to be done to actually figure out how to write the code, 
algorithms are typically very new, very different, you know, not familiar to us. Um, so I would say, uh, I'd close by saying, yeah, we qualify as disruptive. Um, these are what our systems look like. Uh, this is our uh, factory floor in, uh, right outside of Vancouver. Uh, the, the final assembly happens up in Vancouver. The chips are actually fabricated here in the U.S. And uh, the thing that's the, the big challenge for us is, is, you know, building a community, an ecosystem of users who can start to think about these systems, uh, map problems to them, uh, build tools, you know, put open source projects up on GitHub. That's the real challenge facing us now. And, then, and to the extent that we're disruptive, you know, it's, it's driven by this performance advantage and then also uh, by the notion that, you know, potentially we'll be drawing people from the community of, you know, HPC programmers. So we'll stop there.